I'd like to continue our series on the Word of God and prayer. Prayer and the Scriptures. You know, it's interesting this week, if you're watching the news, the Supreme Court had made a decision that gay marriage was okay and expects every state to go along with it. The word Supreme Court is a joke because it's not the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is God. In fact, in yesterday's paper, you saw these men and women who are in for life sitting at the inauguration of President Obama, one of them, Ruth Ginsburg, was unconscious. She fell asleep because she was drunk. And she admitted that she likes her wine. These are the people who are going to tell us how to live. It's interesting that a recent poll said 50% of the people in our country are for gay marriage. That means there are 50% who are not. Now, if you want to know anything about the gay lifestyle, ask me. I spent eight years in Greenwich Village. The word gay does not describe people who say they are. But the interesting part of it is what this head judge in Alabama said. He stepped up to the police and he said, how dare the Supreme Court overrule God. God defined marriage. And he made our bodies so that a man and a woman could get married. I was interviewed not too long ago at the United Nations about it. And I said this, I don't understand why people want to get married in the gay lifestyle. Why would a man who hates women want to marry a man who acts like a woman? And why would a woman who hates men want to marry another woman who acts like a man. It doesn't make any sense. And on top of that, the plumbing doesn't match. It is a sordid, evil world that we live in. People want to get whipped. It looks like we're so bored, looking for thrills. But you know what? In the end, God is going to judge all of it. That's why we have to know the Word of God. You see, as Christians, we're the troublemakers. If you're a real Christian, you're a troublemaker because you remind people where the lines are. God doesn't change at the boundaries. He expects us to keep them. We spoke about the importance of reading and meditating on the Word of God because it tells us the truth about ourselves, about others, in the spiritual and the natural world. Remember, meditating on Scripture is dwelling on it with our mind so it can affect our words, our thoughts, and our actions to God's will. This morning, I want to introduce you a powerful tool that we can use in our prayer life that is tied to the Word of God, praying the Scriptures. Our text this morning is found in the fourth chapter of Hebrews, the 12th verse. As you find it, would you stand with me as we honor the Word of God? Are you ready? For the Word of God is quick, alive, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Lord bless the reading of his word. God's word bothers people because it tells the truth. In a world where people who want, or men want to be women and women want to be men, and some people want to be both, our young people are being sold a bag of goods to tolerate everything. God is not a God of toleration. He's a God of truth. His word is the law. The Christian faith, as we know it, is useless without the word of God. The written word of God gives us, through the, given through men, inspired by the word of God, 
what God wants us to be and do. Holy men spoke, the Word of God tells us, as they were moved by the Holy Spirit in 2 Peter 1.21. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we as Christians many times are not using God's Word as God meant it to be used. Often we dissect it, we divide it, and we use it to fit our way of thinking. And I've met people like this who claim to be Christians. We fail to realize that the Bible is a book of God's love, God's wisdom, and God's desire to help us live the abundant life in Christ Jesus that we were meant to have. But the Bible is also a book of prayer. It commands us to pray over 250 times. And it also speaks of prayers and praying another 280 times. In fact, there is not one doctrine in the Bible more mentioned than prayer in the Scriptures. The Bible is full of men and women praying to God and God answering their prayers. You see, a lot of people pray in a lot of different religions, but our God answers. Oh, hallelujah. What is prayer anyway? There are so many religions that have these repetitive prayers. They're very nice, but they're not our prayer. A prayer is something from your heart. It's talking to God and listening to God. It's a personal, intimate time with our Heavenly Father, who is our Creator. If you remember, Adam and Eve didn't have a Bible. They had direct communication and communion with God. But through their choice, they disobeyed, they sinned, and they lost their personal face-to-face -face relationship with God. And what happened? They traded perfection. They traded power. They traded the protection of God for a piece of fruit to gain the knowledge of good and evil. You know, today people have a problem with that. They don't even know what's evil anymore. I'm sure God was grieved by their bad choice, but instead of destroying them, God prophesied that one would come and restore that relationship that Adam and Eve had lost. He was speaking of Jesus Christ and the cross of redemption and forgiveness and restoration. God desired to restore men and women, young and old, to fellowship with himself. God's word to the prophets and holy men of the Old Testament revealed the way to the Father through Jesus Christ. The coming Savior, the Messiah, Listen to what the first chapter of John in the 14th verse says. The Word, and if you read the whole chapter, you'll see the Word was Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. The written Word became the living Word of God. But the purpose was simple, to restore access to God for everyone. The Bible is a textbook of prayer. It tells us when to pray, where to pray, and how to pray. God's Word is described in Hebrews 4.12. We read it. Let me give you the amplified of our text. For the Word that God speaks is alive, operative, energizing, and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating, to the dividing of the breath of life, the soul, and the immortal spirit, and of the joints and marrow of the deepest parts of our nature, exposing and sifting and analyzing and judging the very thoughts and purposes of the heart, our heart. I don't know of any person, pastor, evangelist, or prophet, that can affect us that much. Why? Because only God's Holy Spirit inspired words can bring to light our deep inner desires and our thoughts of our soul and our spirit. You see, sometimes prayer can be 
compared to the crying of a baby. Babies cry out when they have a need. And they're asking someone else, mom, dad, to supply their needs. Many times in our lives, a sudden emergency will cause us to desperately cry out to God for help. Why do we wait for those times to talk to God, to reach out to God? We want our prayers to be a meaningful conversation with God. The scriptures tell us how to pray. Prayer and scripture reading go together. Many times we pray amiss, the Bible says. We have the wrong motives, the wrong desires. And nothing happens. Why? Maybe our prayers are out of God's will. Maybe they don't expose the real need that we have. Amen? When we go to the Bible of our prayer, we can begin to learn the nature of prayer and the purpose of prayer and the power of prayer. Because prayer is really an outcry. It's a cry in the inner part of our being to God himself. Ever notice how prayer bypasses the conscious mind? Hmm? Even people who are not religious can be heard at times saying the following words. You've heard it. Oh, my God. They don't believe in God. Oh, my God. Oh, God, help me. Because built into every soul that God created, there's an awareness of God himself. You ever watch the History Channel? I think one of the most interesting things as they go through the history of different parts, world war battles and so on, is they interview men and women who were there. Now they're in the 80s and 90s, and they relate some of the things that happened to them, the horrors of war. And how these men and women as soldiers cried out to God because they were in fear and trouble. There was a book written many years ago. There are no atheists in foxholes. When we're in trouble, the only one that can help us really is God himself. Even the police and the firemen, they'll joke about it, but many of them carry a little Bible in their pocket. Why? Because they know that only God can protect them. In the Old Testament, there are many examples of God's people crying out to them. And you're going to see something in the Bible that's interesting. It's when we cry out that God seems to answer our prayers. You remember Elihu, the comfort, one of the comforters of Job? He said of the people, in Job 34, 28, they cry out for help because of the arm of the Almighty. He hears the cry of the afflicted. Have you ever had to pray for something where you had to cry out? You were so desperate. You had such a need. There was no way to go and no one to go to. And you began to cry out to God as a last resort. Even David in Psalm 107 Verse 23 speaks about those who go down to the sea in ships, in the great waters, in the stormy winds. He talks about the soul of these men melting. They are at wit's end and they have no hope. And look what it says. Then they cry out to the Lord in their trouble and he brings them out of their distresses. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is almighty and powerful. He is more able to meet our need than anyone else. And God will hear our cry for help in our prayers. Sometimes our cry for help is about our son or daughter, grandson, granddaughter, to our Father in heaven. We just give up. There's nothing more we can do but only God as we cry out to him. In the last 300 years, the Hebrew people that were in Egypt, they became slaves with no hope. They forgot God. And finally, the people cry out to God for deliverance. Isn't that amazing? It only took them 300 years to figure it out. 
They cry out. And God calls Moses, an 80-year-old man, in the desert by the burning bush to lead the people out of Egypt. And God tells Moses to go back, to go back to Egypt because God had heard the cry of his people. Jesus in Luke 18 gives us a story about an unjust judge and a widow. She had a need, and he didn't want to hear it. And he begins the peri- this parable by telling us men and women ought always to pray and not faint, not give up. You ever give up in praying? Oh, God didn't hear my prayer. He heard it, but maybe we need to look at how we're praying and what we're praying for. You see, prayer is a conversation. It's crying out to God in times of trouble. And it has to be a conversation with God where we talk to God and he speaks to us. I think sometimes we don't pray about things because we don't want God to tell us the truth. Should I marry this man? Should I marry this woman? What are we afraid of if we want the truth? Prayer bridges the gap between heaven and earth. Enables us to know the heart of God, the thoughts of God, and the will of God. You'll notice in the word of God, communication between God and his people often came through angels, It came through prophets, and it came through priests. But in the New Testament, oh, hallelujah, that we live in, Jesus came to be our mediator and to pray in his name. Hmm? Look what he said in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except by me. Wow. In our prayers, we find that God is interested in every aspect of our lives. Not just the desperate things. Big or small, God is interested in everything about us. We, the creation, can speak to the creator anytime, any place, for any reason. You know, in the Old Testament, every time they sinned, they had to make a sacrifice. Every time they wanted something, they had to make a sacrifice. It cost them something. Hmm? Thank God that's not the case in the New Testament. We'd run out of animals to sacrifice. We'd run out of money to sacrifice because Jesus paid the price so that we can pray to God himself. Prayer is also communion with God. We have the communion. Sin broke the communion that Adam and Eve had, but the blood of Jesus restored it to us. He came to restore our personal relationship with the Father. Hallelujah. It's a relationship with God himself. Look how important you are. You can talk to the one who created everything. What a privilege. Try to make an appointment with the president of the United States or even the governor or the mayor, and you can't get near them. But we can talk to God who is all things, anytime, anywhere. What a privilege we have. You see, prayer also goes beyond asking for things and begins by enjoying God's presence. Hmm? In the Psalms, over and over, we read about prayer and relationship with God. Psalm 5, verse 1 to 3. Give heed to the voice of my cry, David writes. For to you, my King and my God, I will pray. In Psalm 62, Truly my soul silently waits for God. From him comes my salvation. You see, David had a love affair with God. Hmm? 
God himself said, he's a man after my own heart. And yet we know he was certainly not perfect, was he? He sinned. He made mistakes. But yet God loved him. And God spoke to him. Moses was a praying man. The Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend in Exodus 33. The bottom line is this. If it were not for the scriptures, our prayers would never go beyond our voice. The scriptures tell us about the power of confession. Hmm? The power of forgiveness. And over 3,000 promises of God to his people and for all kinds of things. The scriptures give us hope and give us peace. You know what the world is looking for is in the word of God. They're looking for happiness. They're looking for peace. And they're trying to find it in every kind of way. But every one of those ways is wrong. We're going to be talking more about praying in the Scripture because it has to do with if we believe it or not. You ever go through a situation in your life where a spirit of fear comes over you? You're afraid to make a decision, to take a step, to do something that may affect your whole life? Today, so many people are in fear. They have anxieties. They're taking pills. They're taking all kinds of things to try to help them, and it doesn't work. In fact, in some cases, it drives them into insanity. But look what the Word of God says. And here's one of those scriptures you can pray back to God. God, did you not say this? God has not given us a spirit of fear. But he goes on, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. A lot of people think that Christians are crick or crazy, but in reality, they are. Because being crazy is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different ending or a different solution. The spirit of power of love. Oh, hallelujah. Look what it says in Isaiah 53, 5. Look at the tenses in here. You know what a tense is? Past, present, or future? This is from the Old Testament. It's a prophecy about Jesus Christ. They don't read this chapter in the synagogues because it sounds too much like Jesus Christ. In the fifth verse, it says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement, the need for us, our peace was upon him. Now listen to the last part of it. And with his stripes, we are healed. Present tense. Hallelujah. Let me end with a little story. Some of you may remember a gentleman by the name of Joe D'Angelo. Joe's a little short guy, lived in Texas, got himself in some trouble in a fight, and ended up killing someone. He didn't intend to. In New York, we call it manslaughter. Was sentenced to prison. Being in prison and being small, he was picked on. So he acted crazy to get put into isolation. So he'd be away from the general population. Anyway, one day, as he was being thrown in the hole, as they called it, they took all your clothes off and they threw you in by yourself. One of the correction officers took a little Bible and threw it at this so-called crazy man, hit him in the chest, and said, read this, and they slammed the door. For 30 days, all he had in that room 
was that little book. And they began to read it. Oh, hallelujah. He began to read it. And he realized who he was and what he had done. And that there was a Savior and one who could forgive and one who could change a life. To make a long story short, he came out of that place a different person. He did so much good in prison. It was almost like Joseph, where the prison prospered because of him. Eventually, the governor of Texas pardoned him. He came this way as a pastor. He went to school. And one day, while he was living in Staten Island, he got very sick with his heart. He was terminally ill. And we were praying for him. And Joe did something very interesting. I had told you a couple of weeks ago, this book is not a trophy. Wear it out. Underline it. Highlight it. Write in the pages as God speaks to you. Joe did something that most people would say is crazy. He took a new Bible, he went from cover to cover, and he underlined every scripture about healing. Underlined it and prayed it back to God. God, didn't you say this? Didn't you say that about healing? I believe. T.D. Jakes, I was watching him a couple of nights ago, was talking about something similar. He was saying this. The word of God doesn't work unless we, in faith, mix the word with our faith. You can hear the word and say, I don't believe it. It's not going to work. Even though you may not say it with your mouth, you may be saying it with your mind. But if you don't put the word and faith together, it doesn't work. It's a formula. Anyway, Joe was so depressed because he prayed the, every scripture in the word of God about healing, and he was still sick. And he did something you may say is irreligious. He took that Bible, he put it on the ground, and he stood on it. And he said, God... I'm standing on your word. And guess what happened? God healed him. We're going to see something in the next few weeks. We read the word. We just said the word is alive. It's powerful. Do we believe it? Because whatever we're going through, this book will tell us the answer. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. Help us to realize, Lord, that there is nothing that you cannot do. There is nowhere that you cannot go. There is no one that you cannot reach. There is no one that cannot be forgiven. Lord, help us, Lord. As we read the word, speak to our hearts as we go through situations in our life. Help us to listen to what you're saying to us. Help us, Lord, to see your will for our lives. Help us, Lord, to be victorious every day because the word of God becomes alive in our mouth, in our actions, and even in our thoughts. Shall we stand?